was simply to execute the plan. That is, you, you know, hired engineers and you hired sales and marketing, biz dev, uh, but engineering went into waterfall engineering and you went to alpha test, beta test, first customer ship. And the model kind of proceeded from there. You would launch the product, everybody would high five the VP of marketing, you got some great press, you'd have your first board meeting, the investors be looking at that spreadsheet you gave them, you know, that said revenue plan, and they'd say, how are we doing? This is after the launch. And the VP of sales would almost always say, great pipeline. <laughs> okay, only the people in the back are laughing. So let me say, great pipeline, which means, you know, like maybe we'll get some orders, but they're not matching already. And by the way, if this will repeat multiple board meetings. And, um, you know, pipeline, pipeline, until uh, one day the VCs and practices, they arch one eyebrow and turn their head at about a 45 degree angle to the CEO. And at the next board meeting, you open the door and you realize no one's sitting next to the VP of sales. Um, in fact, the stench of death is in the room. And the minute he or she would say, pipeline, poof, puff of smoke, pile of ashes, and a new VP of sales would come in who would say, what a stupid strategy. Well, obviously, you know, we're going to do a new strategy. Now, this would repeat for another six to nine months until the new VP of sales isn't making the plan, and all of a sudden, you'd open the boardroom door and no one was sitting next to the VP of marketing, because obviously, it was a positioning problem. Couldn't be the new sales strategy. You just hired a new genius set of sales, and this would repeat. And then finally, they'd fire the CEO. And the CEO would either be holding onto the door frame, suing the company, or blah, 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 or get promoted to, you know, chief strategy officer. <laughs> How many of you are now chief strategy or have been through that? <laughs> so if this sounds familiar, you go, Steve, you've just described Silicon Valley. What the heck's wrong with that? The problem, if we think back, and now this is only hysterical, only in hindsight, is that the only time we would change the strategy of the company is by firing an executive. We never once assumed that perhaps the initial strategy, that genius plan you made up, you know, under the influence of some substance and got VCs to buy into, maybe some of that was wrong. But in fact, in the entire 20th century, what we assumed, and here was the big insight, Bobic, back to answer your question, is that startups were nothing more than smaller versions of large companies. That was the assumption we operated, entrepreneurs operated, and investors operated in Silicon Valley for the first three decades of its life. We were wrong. Startups are not smaller versions of large companies. Large companies at their core, at their core, execute a known business model. Large companies know who their customers are, no competitors, no pricing, no product market fit, no all that stuff. But in a startup, most of the time, you're starting with a series of untested hypotheses. And I use the fancy word hypotheses at Stanford because my students are paying $50,000 a year, but outside of Stanford, the word hypotheses means you're just guessing about most of the things that make up the commercialization side of your business. And so the lean startup was a reaction to all this. The lean startup said, while large companies execute business models, startups search for business models. And while we had spent a hundred years building tools and techniques that came out of business schools for execution, we had no management strategy for searching. And so the lean startup, on a tactical level, is three components. It says, look, if all we're starting with is a series of untested hypotheses, why don't we use some way to kind of deconstruct or put on a simple piece of paper what those hypotheses are. And we use something called the business model canvas. Have any, any of you seen this? It's from a guy named Alexander Osterwalder. If you don't have his book called Business Model Generation, uh, you should buy it. And the reason why I love it, it's all pictures. Uh, no words, you don't have to like slog through 400 pages of some arcane text. It's a picture. And it says, here are the nine things you need to worry about, which is not your org chart, because that used to be the default. If you drew any diagram in a startup, it used to be, well, here's sales, here's marketing, here's engineering. Turns out that's the last thing you should be drawing. 
The first thing you should be drawing is, who are my customers? What's product market fit? What's my channel? What's my revenue strategy? What are my pricing tactics? How do I get, keep, and grow customers? Those are the things you need to be drawing, not putting it in a 40-page plan, but actually putting them up as a picture. The second part of the Lean Startup says once you've done that, that is, articulate your hypotheses about your business, the second thing you need to do is get out of the building and test the hypothesis. And this is my contribution. In a book called The Four Steps of the Epiphany and then the Startup Owner's Manual, I invented a process called the Customer Development Process. Great startups did this for decades anyway. The not so great startups, most of the ones I did, you know, assumed that, well, I was the founder, I obviously got funded, therefore I implicitly not only understand the customer problem, but I could write the product spec on day one. And my team just needed to go implement my vision. Well, it turns out that, how many of you think you're visionaries? Come on, raise your hand. Yeah? So I have enough data to say about 99% of you are actually hallucinating. <laughs> And so the problem is, we don't know which one of you are the visionaries. And, and so the insight about customer development is while you might be, let's guarantee, you are the smartest person in your building, and you can win every argument in a system planning meeting, I'll guarantee you there's no possible way you could be smarter than the collective intelligence of your potential customers. It's a big idea. And so the job is, is to get outside of the building and test all these hypotheses. And this is not a giant focus group, and we'll talk later, Bavik, about it's not a giant focus group, and no, it's not about asking people you know, what features they want, and no, it's not just about existing markets. You could do it for new and disruptive things. But the goal is, is to get outside. And you get outside by building what are called minimum viable products. You get input. And the third piece of the Lean Startup is this piece called the Agile Engineering. And in Agile Engineering, we're not building alpha, beta, first customer ship. We're building things that get us the maximum amount of learning at any point in time. It could be a wireframe, it could be a PowerPoint slide, it could be a piece of the hardware or software, it could be, you know, here's the instruction set of a new microprocessor, it doesn't matter. What you're trying to do is elicit feedback. First feedback is, am I on the right path? And then second, the most important feedback, is can I get orders or users before the product is ever completed? And if there's none of that, then, you know, like you have to do something called a pivot, which is a substantive change to one or, your, one or more of the business model canvas components. What we invented in the Lean Startup is this notion of before you fire executives, let's fire the plan. It's a big idea. And that actually translates into something called a pivot. So to answer your question in more than 30 seconds, the Lean Startup is business model canvas, customer development, Agile engineering. Great. Thanks. A ton of great what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> you answered it just fine. A ton of questions coming in from the audience, so keep them coming. Um, one of the things I still hear investors ask for is a five-year financial projections with two decimal accuracy. Right. When's your first customer ship? You know, how does this change for the investor? Well, you know, um, usually those come from investors who've actually never done a startup or, or have been to business school um, you know, over five years ago. Now, how many of you have been to business school? Okay. Um, and I keep your hands up. How many of you have been to business school uh, more than five years ago? Okay. Everything you learned about entrepreneurship was wrong. Seriously. No, no joke. It's not that anybody was being dumb or stupid, but the capstone class, meaning the, the top level class you used to take was how to write a business plan. Anybody ever take that class? I used to teach it. it you know, it's, it's great, except we now know that, um, you know, no business plan survives first contact with customers, right? You can write all the plans you want, but the minute, like, you get out into the real world, when's the last time you looked at the plan? And, and the second and more depressing thing is, at least in the 21st century, it, you know, no VC ever reads the plan. And, and, and so you, we were doing this stuff without actually having a substitute, and so if I'm an investor, you'd go, okay, this lean stuff is nice, but how does it change the rules I look at, at deals? And, and so the, the, let me just give you the sum, is that we now know how to, in fact, give investors the evidence and data they used to, in fact, give you half a million or a million dollars for in a seed round. We now know how to have startups 
generate enough evidence to create evidence-based entrepreneurship that they could come to you with just 10 weeks of work on a credit card and say, here's what I learned talking to 100 to 150 customers, partners, et cetera. It's not just an idea. Here's what I learned. Boy, if they do that on the credit card, you just saved yourself a half a million bucks. And this is not, by the way, this is not theory. We've put 500 teams from the U.S. government through this process uh, in something called the National Science Foundation Innovation Corps. They speak to 100 to 150 customers in 10 weeks. Now imagine you're an investor and I got someone coming in saying, hey, I got a great idea versus someone coming in and say, I have a great idea. And let me tell you what it was on day one. And let me tell you what happened after, you know, week three. And let me tell you what happened after week five and 10. Holy cow. Now, you still might decide that the first idea was better because they invented anti-gravity, but given two equal deals, now all of a sudden you actually have a lot more evidence about one than you had about the other. Did I answer your question? Yes, and, and the search for a repeatable, scalable business model is a big idea, and every time we use the word, the phrase, a big idea, we you, get, need, you get a beer. We get a beer. <laughs> um, so, Steve, what's common about the lean startup in the early stage ventures and a large company. Yeah, so, um, so, you know, people hear the phrase lean or lean startup and think it's only about startups. It turns out it's not about startups. Um, it turns out it's where my attention was focused for the first five or 10 years, but um, about two years ago, actually almost two years ago this month, I got a call from the Harvard Business Review who said, you know, we got companies interested in this. and. So I wrote an article, that, and it's on my website if anybody wants to see it, called The Lean Startup Changes Everything, and it ended up on the cover of the Harvard Business Review. And I started getting calls from people whose titles I never even recognized, which was Chief Innovation Officer. And I went, what the heck is that? Um, and they said, well, we're, we're actually trying to figure that out of ourselves. That's what we called you. <laughs> and, and so I've realized, and we'll talk about companies in a second, that companies are also dealing with not only the innovation problem, but actually, it's, it, the reason why they're dealing with it now is they're facing continuous disruption. I know Jack Welsh spoke yesterday. How many of you saw Jack uh, speak? So um, the good news is Jack Welsh set the rules for innovation in the 20th century. The bad news is, if he was here, I would just tell, it, tell it to him to his face, is that all the Jack Welsh rules, if you follow them in the 21st century in a corporation, you're going out of business. It's a big idea. All the Jack Welsh rules that mattered in the 20th century, and, and I'm going into corporate first, but we'll get back to answer your entrepreneurship question. Be number one or two in a market, you know, top 10%, blah, blah, blah. Those are great when, in fact, you could own a market yourself and the barriers to entry for competition required millions or billions of dollars. A lot of those fundamental assumptions, they weren't stupid. They were brilliant in the 20th century. But the Internet, globalization, and a whole set of things that have just changed everything were... Yeah, I'll give you an example. How many of you in the software business, startups, right? So when I was an entrepreneur, the minimum ante to start a software company was $4 million from Sand Hill Road. You know, a million bucks by a vax and hardware, uh, number, another million bucks, you know, for uh, software, Oracle or whatever, another couple million bucks because the whole process of launching a product took 18 months to two years. And so I burned through 4 million bucks of cash. Well, today, you know, most of you are using Amazon Web Services, computing as a utility. You have a, at your fingertips probably 100x more computing power that existed in the entire world. The cost of entry for a software startup has decreased by a factor of 1,000, 1,000 in 30 years that I've been in entrepreneurship. Other, industry, other industries haven't been as dramatic, but equally the barriers to entry. So if I'm a large company, I'm just facing things I've never had to face before, ever, ever. But to answer your question about, uh, about entrepreneurs and what's common, what's common is the lean startup does not, and you've heard it from me, guarantee that you're going to be successful. It has nothing to do with success. It has to do with giving you more shots on the goal in less time with less money, meaning it dramatically decreases the amount of resources, time, money, and people you need and, and given that, in a startup, you have a finite amount of cash, unlike in, in a large company, it lengthens the runway you have just dramatically. Because how many of you startup CEOs? Any founding CEOs? Yep. Um, so I remember, you know, I did eight startups in 21 years. And, and when I was the CEO of a startup, I woke up every morning 
first thing is I have three numbers in my head. What's my burn rate? How much cash do I have left in the bank? And the day, hour, and minute, I'm going out of business when I run out of cash. And if you're not worrying about that, you, let me tell you, you ought to be, someone else ought to be running your company. So all of a sudden, now I'm driven out of this sense of urgency. Now, if I could have a tool that actually gave me more turns and more shots at the goal, that's what the Lean Startup is about. It allows us to be incredibly efficient about our time. For those of you in computer science, what we've done is taken startups from being an NP complete problem to at least NP hard, meaning it's just hard now. But we've provided a bounding box of what are the things you should be worrying about first. Well, we now know the first thing you should be worrying about is product market fit, at least for everything but life sciences. That is, what's the fit between my feature set and customer needs? Then I should be worrying about channel. Then I should be wor worrying about revenue. Then I should be worrying about customer acquisition costs. And it actually has a methodology to kind of walk you through that rather than, oh, I just hired a great VP of sales. Well, that's what we used to do. Oh, and they have a great Rolodex. And by the way, they're a golf game. Spectacular. Right? Six foot four. Six foot four, right. White guy with, you know, blonde hair, looks good, you know, whatever. Um, you know, has problems operating, you know, like PowerPoint, but that's okay. Um, what was the question? <laughs> so I was, I was expecting this question, and it has come from the audience, which leads to what's different about the lean startup when applied to a large company? And the question yeah. specific was the difference between design thinking and the lean startup. Wow. So, so let's start. All right. Let's start with the design. How many of you heard of design thinking? Another great get out of the building methodology. It's spectacular. But it is not customer development, which is the core part of the lean startup. And let me just give you the 30 second distinction. Customer development, because it's the one, in fact, I used to get asked this, and for years, I, even I struggled with this till I remembered, wait a minute, I invented one of these, so at least I ought to be able to answer. So what was I thinking when I thought about customer development? Customer development, remember that gun to your head burn rate? It was to solve the burn rate problem. That is, in a startup, there's a sense of urgency that exists like no other in the world, except maybe in combat. You've got to make decisions, good enough decisions. Not perfect decisions, because you will never have enough data in a startup. You need to make good enough decisions at speed and rapidly and every day if you're the founding CEO and CEO team. So the customer development process was designed to get good enough data rapidly. And the stake in the ground for customer development is I'm a technology company who already has in mind a value proposition. That is, I know what I'm building, or at least my founders think I know what I'm building. I'm not going to go out and spend, you know, a year asking customers. I know what I'm building, and so I desperately need to find a market for what I just got funded for. That's at least the, the world I came out of. Semiconductor companies, enterprise software, video games. I'm building something. Find me a market. That's customer development. That's part of the lean startup. There's another getting out of building technique, which is not wrong. It's just radically different. It says, I don't know what I'm building but I do know who my customers are. It starts with, instead of the value proposition, it starts with a customer segment. It says, I know my customer segments. Where would you know your customer segments? Your Procter & Gamble. You know consumers, you got more data about them than anywhere else. You know it's specific housewives, they live in the Midwest, they use these other products and whatever. And now I need to figure out what else can I make to sell to these people? And so design thinking starts with a very different place. It starts with known customers. Lean Startup starts with known technology. Design thinking historically, and this is just an artifact of where it came from, started with large companies. I know my customers. But the downside, believe it or not, about starting with a large company is I have all the time in the world. I could make this an open-ended research project. Why don't we go out and spend months, years, you know, trying to figure out what else we need? In a startup, I don't have months or years. I got burn rate, and I'm desperate to find product market fit. And so they come from very different places. Neither one of them are correct. It depends on what the needs are for the company. Um, if you're a startup and you're thinking, though, you're doing design thinking, I hope you didn't take anybody's money yet because you're going to run out of money before you figure that out. Eventually, you need to put a stake in the ground and move with speed and urgency. Did that answer your question? Yeah. All right. So on, on similar lines, a lot of startups get acquired yep. by big companies. And, 
And by the way, we should talk we should about talk. more of the differences about big companies and right. Insurance. So I think I'm tying that okay, especially with big companies and when it comes to acquisitions. Right. There are some dirty little secrets about you know numbers of success. Uh, could you share your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, uh, this is one is when I used to be on the board of uh, some large companies, we must have done 20, 30 startups, and, and I think we probably screwed up 20, 30 startups, um, only because we didn't have a theory about um, acquiring startups. And now I kind of think of, uh, I think there really is a right way for a large company to get acquired, and for a startup who's interested more than just cashing out to be thinking about the right acquirer and it goes like this so why would a large company want to acquire a startup or uh, another company number one it could be an aqua hire right an aqua hire is i'm acquiring it for the talent i don't care about the products we're going to shut it down we're just acquiring the people there could be a, a another level oh uh, I, or i could be acquiring it for even something simpler you know i don't even care about the people i care about the ip thank you very much all right or i could care about the uh, company because i'm really interested in the product it doesn't have any sales yet, but, you know, it's Oculus. You know, great, it's, you know, sales are zero, but, you know, I think the technology, if I use it, it's going to be wonderful. Or the third is I could be acquiring it for the product and its user base. Um, WhatsApp, another great example. Hasn't been able to monetize it yet, but, boy, you know, I'm the acquirer. I know how to monetize that stuff. That's great. And then, finally, I could be acquiring it for its P&L. It has customers, it has a repeatable sales process, it has revenue, it's going to be accretive to my company. It turns out that if you're a large company, completely assimilating a startup, regardless of the phase it is, is in, almost guarantees you're throwing that money in the street. Turns out what you want to do is think about it for a second. If it's, you're acquiring for IP or you're acquiring for team, or requiring at the high end, it has an existing P&L, an existing whatever, go integrate the company into your organization tightly. I call it Borg it, for those of you who watch Star Trek, right? Just literally assimilate it. But if it's a startup still searching for product market fit, the worst possible thing you could do is hand them your 700-page HR manual and your 14-page form on how to fill out an expense report and tell them that free dinners and dogs are no longer allowed at work. Why? Because in fact, at that phase, it's actually the culture of the startup that you're acquiring, not just the product. You're acquiring its speed of learning. And in fact, in those cases, you actually want to keep that startup as a standalone division and give it essentially a corporate concierge with access, but a firewall for the resource. So they might be able to use your channel, or they might be able to use some of your dollars, or marketing, or customer acquisition, or whatever, but you really need to keep that culture separate until it does find product market fit and can scale. And then you could decide later of whether you want to integrate it in or not. Did I answer your question? Yeah. So I think we have time for one last question. Uh, big companies in GE, Adobe, Intuit, are, have realized playing it safe is actually riskier in the 21st century. And they are adopting the entrepreneurial culture, not only to attract and retain talent, but also to adopt a new common language. Right. Um, what have you seen from your vantage point, and why are, what are the common processes and metrics and tools for innovation? Well, I mentioned earlier, I started getting calls from chief innovation officers. And the first thing that almost always happens in a large company is when their board or CEO says, Let's, we need to be more innovative, is they set up a corporate incubator. And I could almost now do a re remote diagnostic um, because I kind of call these things uh, innovation theater. You know, it, it looks good. You know, I could tell my board and whatever we got, we see we're innovative and whatever. And my diagnostic is you ask, so what happens to the teams after they like graduate from the incubator? And, and if the answer is, well, we're still working on that, you know, that's the definition of innovation theater. If in fact they say, let me tell you our, process of integrating these inside of our, uh, uh, our divisions, and let me tell you how the operating divisions are involved, and let me tell you the activities we're doing inside um, all the uh, functional units or, or, or divisions, then in fact people are kind of getting a handle on it. But the biggest problem in trying to slap lean into a large company is not understanding that all the processes and procedures, this is a big idea, and incentives, 
that have been put together to run that execution machinery. That is, I'm executing every day. I have product management. I have sales comp plans. I have KPIs. I have metrics. Every one of those strangles innovation in its crib. It's a big idea. It doesn't mean anybody's going to be stupid or dumb or doesn't want to be innovative, but the processes and procedures you put in place for execution, another big idea, cannot be the same as the ones for innovation. You need separate parallel processes, not separate organizations, but at times separate processes that recognize that innovation processes are very different. Innovation KPIs are very different. Innovation incentive programs are very different. And part of the core of this problem, by the way, is over the last 20 years, the title chief executive, ch CEO used to mean chief executive officer. Um, nowadays, it seems in some companies that it really means chief execution officer, where all they want to do is crank out more and more of the same product, you know, jettisoning manufacturing, jettisoning R&D, and making the numbers and return on that assets look great, which is ironic, as Clayton Christensen pointed out, because cash is almost free, yet we've thrown out all the stuff that makes us innovative. And so a lot of large companies are realizing that that isn't a productive long-term strategy given all the external challenges that they're facing in the 21st century. Uh, so we're seeing companies trying to figure this out. I'm helping them. I know you're helping them in your last company in Launchpad Central and this new one, which is innovation is everyone. Yeah, innovation and, within. Um, and, uh, and so we're seeing large corporations uh, grapple with this as well, and a good number of them are, are starting to do a pretty good job. So thank you, Steve. I'm, I'm really excited to have you, uh, you know, invest and be an advisor in innovation within. We're building an amazing team. Co-founder James is in the audience, and yes, we are hiring. So with that, uh, we are ending right on time. Can we take one question? You can give take me, one. Give me one question. Right, well, one, one, one anybody question. be mad if we go over I, I for have, a minute? Actually, I have one right here. All right. What's uh, the best question the best you got? Question, the best Does it have question. someone's name? Let's give them the best no, question. All right. But, but you can stand up is, and acknowledge it was your best Does the lean question. startup work in sectors like life sciences? Well, that is a great question. Um, so um, I've written in every book I ever wrote, NFW. No way. Right? Of course, um, <laughs> I was wrong. <laughs> Cross that out if you have any of my books. Say no. <laughs> it turns out um, when we started uh, the Lean Startup uh, with the National Science Foundation um, about four years ago, it works for you know, robotics and computer science and material science and whatever. Um, UCSF approached me um, who said, Steve, we want to run this for life sciences. And I said, well, didn't you see my book? It says it won't work here. And they said, didn't you see the name over our door? It says, we know something about life sciences. Um, and I said, well, it's not going to work. They said, why don't you get out of the building with us? And I went and talked to venture capitalists and Larry Lasky and um, um, a whole bunch of VCs uh, um, who, who kind of were experts in the space. And they said, Steve, this is desperately needed. We spend more money over more years here for therapeutics and diagnostics and devices and now digital health. Um, we need a class for this. So we stood up or, or started a a class that's uh, UCSF, 25 teams, eight in each one of those domains, therapeutics, uh, diagnostics, devices, digital health. And by week four, it was obvious it not only would work, these guys actually, because in life sciences, they know they don't know, um, were much better at this than even the NSF guys. And so the National Institute of Health flew out, sat through a couple of the classes and said, oh my gosh, we need this at the NIH. And make a long story short, um, the Lean Launchpad is now being taught for life sciences in multiple universities. We ran a pilot for the NIH. They're going to roll it out. The Department of Energy um, announced, uh, I think a month ago, that they're going to start what, it's, what they call LabCorp later this year. They're running a team through um, an i note at University of Michigan, literally as we speak, to get practice. And then I think in September, October, they're going to scale it for clean tech. So, you know, it kind of works for everything, not because it's right. It's just because it's efficient. So you're saying the days of faith-based investing are over? Right. Well, I, I don't think the days of faith-based investing are over. It just means we have an alternative to faith-based investing, which is evidence-based investing. And, and I think, you know, investing in entrepreneurship will always be a combination of, you know, this great instinct, this fingertip feel of entrepreneurs. It's never going to be, we're going to be data-driven. I mean, I don't ever see this being quant-driven, but I see the... The, uh, getting data now informing our instincts, um, especially because we now know how to get data very rapidly. So thanks, Bobak. I, th I think these are great questions. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Blank.
Thank you, guys. Right.